Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. This is Ruel Barksdale, your host for Walking Through the Book of Genesis. Today we will be looking at the 38th chapter of Genesis. And my God, I, you know what? When you look at what God is doing with the family of Jacob, my thought earlier this week was God looked throughout all of eternity and somehow settled on this band of misfits to become the 12 tribes of Israel. Uh, we look at Simeon and Levi, who were mass murderers. We look at Reuben, who slept with his father's concubine. Today we'll look at Judah, who was also absolutely a mess. And yet God in his sovereignty does not call the qualified, he qualifies the called. And because of that truth, there's hope for you and I. So get a piece of paper, get a pencil. Um, please follow this on YouTube, on Facebook, on Podbean. Uh, and if you'd be so kind, share it with somebody so we can get this word out. We're trying to do a Bible study for those that might not have the opportunity or the availability of going to a Bible study or just simply don't go to church. We're talking in everyday language about the word, the will, and the way of God. So I thank you for joining me. Turn to the 38th chapter as we'll walk through the book of Genesis. Okay, now, I, before we look at the book of Genesis, uh, I certainly want to um, go through a few chapters uh, before we actually get into the book of G uh, the 38th chapter, rather. And we're going to start this, oh, we're going to start our study today with Genesis, the 15th chapter, verses 13 through 15. Um, the reason why I want to do this, it, it, it would seem like the 38th chapter is an interruption of the story. Seems out of place because in chapter 37, we're, we're looking at the trials and the tribulations, the test of Joseph. And when we go to chapter 39, we'll, look at, we'll, we'll be looking at the trials, the tribulations, and the test of Joseph. And, and so the 38th chapter just seems as an interruption of the story. But upon, upon further uh, reflection, we see that chapter 38 explains something that we're about to read in chapter 15. I often refer to the children of Jacob as a band of misfits, and yet God chose this family to become the, the ancestors of the 12 tribes of Israel, but they're not ready. And there are going to be generations that will have to come and go before they're ready to inhabit the promise that God gave to Abraham. And so chapter 38 gives us more insight as to how unready they were and why chapter 15, what we're about to read, was so necessary. So let's go to Genesis chapter 15, verses 13 through 15. Then the Lord said to him, Know for certain, know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own, and they will be enslaved and mistreated for 400 years. But I will punish the nation uh, they serve as slaves, and afterwards they will come out with great possessions. When we look very closely at tonight's lesson, we'll see that Judah is marrying people, interacting with people, intermingling with people that God never intended him to interact with. And so God has to put them in a place where interaction won't be necessary, won't be possible, because the people that will enslave them don't want them, don't ha have nothing to do with them. And sometimes God has to put us in a place where our inclinations aren't possible so he can give us the promise that he always wanted to give us. They're going to have to go through some things to get ready to possess the land, to possess the promise, to possess the destiny that God always had for them. Uh, they're going to, in fact, be enslaved or in the land of their enemies for 430 years exactly before they're ready to possess the land. 
So that's Genesis. Now there's a there is a custom here that I I have to tell you about because it's it, it it's strange to us. It's it's not something that we would uh, recognize as being normal in the 21st century. So I would ask that you turn with me to Deuteronomy uh, chapter 25, and we're going to read uh, 5 through 10, verses 5 through 10. Deuteronomy chapter 25, we're going to read verses 5 through 10, and we're going to look at something called the Liverite marriage, uh, the Liverite or Liverette marriage. Uh, chapter 25, Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy is the fifth book of the Torah, the fifth book of the law of Moses. Uh, in this book, um, the children of Israel are being told, now, this is how you're going to have to live. When you, when you get into the promised land, to inhabit the promised land, these are the laws, these are the customs, these, these are the values that I expect you to live with. This is your norm. This is how I expect you to interact with each other. Okay, Deuteronomy 25, verses 5 through 10. If brothers are living together and one of them dies without a son, his widow must not marry outside the family. Her husband's brother shall take her and marry her and fulfill the duty of a brother-in-law to her. The first son she bears shall carry on the name of the dead brother so that his name will not be blotted out of Israel. However, if a man does not want to marry his brother's wife, she shall go to the elders at the town gate and say, My husband's brother refuses to carry on his brother's name in Israel. He will not fulfill the duty of a brother-in-law to me. Then the elders of his town shall summon him and talk to him. If he persists in saying, I do not want to marry her, his brother's widow shall go up to him in the presence of the elders, take off one of his sandals, spit in his face, and say, this is what is done to the man who will not build up his brother's family line. That man's line shall be known in Israel as the family of the unsandaled. And so there are several reasons for this custom. One, there, the widow had a hard life. There was no social security. There was no unemployment insurance. There was no workers' compensation. There was, there was no societal safety net, no Medicare, no Medicaid. There was no safety net for the widow. And so the law was that you, being the brother-in-law, would marry your brother's or widow and have children by your brother's widow so his name would not be blotted out. And then his children would be in line for the uh, rights of the oldest son. His, his, his brother then had a responsibility the, the brother of the widow would have a responsibility to carry on the name of his brother. So his brother's name would not be blotted out in the history of, of the nation. Now we can go to Genesis, the 38th chapter. That's called the Liberate, Liberate Marriage. Okay, so let's go now to Genesis 38. Now, well, one, one more thing. Before we get to 38, let's, let's look at the end of 37 to make sense of, of 38. Some terrible things have, have, have happened. I told you this was a band of misfits. Um, <sighs> Jacob's sons had just conspired against their younger brother, Joseph. Some of them wanted to kill him, but, um, but Judah... And his greedy self said, "Man, let's not kill him. We ain't gonna get nothing for killing him. Let's sell, let's sell him for twenty pieces of silver. Get some money from from it at least. So let let's read what that looks like. Uh, Genesis thirty-seven verses twenty-six through thirty-four. Judah said to his brothers, what, "What will we gain if we kill our brother and cover up his blood? Come, let let's sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him. After all, he is our brother. Really." 
our own flesh and blood, his brothers agreed. So when the Midianite merchants came by, his, his brothers pulled Joseph up out of the cistern and sold him for 20 shekels of silver to the Ishmaelites who took him to Egypt. When Reuben returned to the cistern and saw that Joseph was not there, he tore his clothes. He went back to his brothers and said, The boy isn't there. Where can I turn now? Then they got Joseph's robe, slaughtered a goat, and dipped the robe in the blood. They took the ornamented robe back to their father and said, We found this. and Examine it to see whether it's your son's robe. He recognized it and said, it is my son's robe. Some ferocious animal has devoured him. Joseph has surely been torn to pieces. Then Jacob tore his clothes, put on sackcloth, and mourned for his son many days. Now, verse 35 says something about this band of misfits. misfits. All his sons and daughters came to comfort him. And they knew what had happened. They knew what the truth was. They knew that he they had thrown him into a uh, a, a, a pit and while he was in the pit they had a picnic and then they sold him for 20 pieces of silver they knew and then they put a, put his robe in some blood to make it seem like some wild dev- I, I, they dishonored their father they dishonored their their god they dishonored their brother they were they were terrible people and Judah was the ring leader at this point no, he said, in the morning will I go down in morning will I go down to the grave to my son. So his father wept for him. Meanwhile, the Midianites sold Joseph in Egypt to Potiphar, one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard. And we don't get the rest of that story until chapter thirty nine. So why does thirty eight start well, it, it seems like an interruption? But it's necessary for us to understand the depravity of this family so that we understand back in Genesis, it's going to take 400 and some years before you guys are ready to inhabit the promised land, but your descendants will inhabit the promised land. You're not ready yet. Y'all going to have to go through some stuff. Going will have to work some stuff out. And sometimes God wants... The, the, there's a straight line be- between what God wants to do in your life, between what God wants to do in my life, but we get in the way. We, 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 we try to help God out, or we try to do things our way. And so th- th- we, we take longer, much longer, we take detours between what God has promised us and where we are, and that's what we're going to see with the children of Israel. Verse 1, chapter 38. At that time, at what time? After they had sold his brother Joseph to the Midianites? At what time? After they had lied to their father about what happened? At what time? After Judah had convinced his brothers that, look, we got to get something out of this. We can't just kill him. Let's get some money out of this. At that time, Judah left his brothers and went down to stay with a man of Adullam named Hira. There, Judah met the daughter of a Canaanite man named Shua. He married her and lay with her. She became pregnant and gave birth to a son. Now, you remember that Jacob had been told by his mother and father, don't marry none of these Canaanite women. And I'm sure he told his son that. But Judah was so messy, he's going, he's going to marry outside of the, fa- outside of the faith outside of the religion, people that don't believe in your God, follow a a pagan God. You're going to separate yourself from the family. There Judah met the daughter of a Canaanite man named Shua. He married her and lay with her. She became pregnant and gave birth to a son who he named Ur. She conceived again and gave birth to a son named Onan. She gave birth to still another son and named him Shelah. It was at Gazib that she gave birth to him. Judah got a wife for Ur, his firstborn, and her name was Tamar. But Ur, Judah's firstborn, was wicked in the Lord's sight, so the Lord put him to death. Now, it doesn't say why, what his wickedness was. It doesn't say how he died. But it's a horrible thing for God to look down at you and say, oh, you wicked. That's not going to work out too well for you. Didn't work out too well for her. 
He was so wicked, God said, you, you got to go. So Judah got a wife for Ur's firstborn and named her Tamar. But Ur, Judah's firstborn, was wicked in the Lord's sight, so the Lord put him to death. Then Judah said to Onan, remember the Leverite marriage. This is where we're going to see this. Then Judah said to Onan, lie with your brother's wife and fulfill your duty to her as a brother-in-law to produce offspring for your brother. Now remember, there's a line of succession for the birthright. And Onan says, well, wait a minute now. If I, if I produce a son with my brother's wife, he's in succession to the birthright over him. I ain't having that. Oh, no, no, no. I don't mind laying down with her, but you know, enough is enough. But Onan knew that the offspring would not be his. So whenever he lay with his brother's wife, he spilled his semen on the ground to keep from producing offspring for his brother. Now, that tells me that this, this didn't happen once. It says whenever. So this is a reoccurring event. He didn't mind having sex with the woman. He just didn't want to have his brother's son ahead of him in the birthright succession. I, I, I have sex with you, but that's, that's no, you, I am, you are not going to get pregnant. What he did was wicked in the Lord's sight, so he put him to death also. Now, at this point, at this point, J Judah has lost two sons. He, he lost Ur because he was wicked. He lost Onan because he was weak, but he didn't understand why they're dying. He sees them being connected to Tamar, and maybe he thinks, well, maybe something wrong with her. Like, every time one of my sons gets married to her, they end up dying. Judah then said to his daughter-in-law, Tamar, look, look, I know what the, the, the liverite marriage custom is. I, I only got one more son, uh, and he's too young to get married, so this is what I want you to do. Live as a widow in your father's house until my son Sheila grows up. For he thought he may die too, just like his brothers. So Tamar went to live in her father's house. Now he had no intention of giving uh, Sheila to marry Tamar. He, he, he wasn't going to do that because he didn't want him to die too. So go on, go on, live with your daddy. After a long time, Judah's wife the daughter of Shua died. When, Jua had, when Judah had recovered from his grief, he went up to Timnah to the men who were shearing his sheep. And his friend Hira, Hira the Adulamite, went with him. Now, this was, I, I believe, an annual situation where the men would go share the sheep and afterwards they would party. They would... They would get drunk, they were out of town, they would do whatever they were grown enough to do. Tamar understands, all right, he's going up to this place to, uh, to where they're sharing the sheep. I know what goes on up there. I'm, uh, this is what I'm going to do. He's not going to give me Sheila. I'm not going to die living alone. My parents are old. They're going to die. Who's going to take care of me? I got to put matters into my own hand. Hmm? So Judah then said to his daughter-in-law, Tamar, live as a widow in your father's house until my son Sheila grows up, for he thought he might die too, just like his brothers. So Tamar went to live in her father's house. After a long time, Judah's wife, the daughter of Shua, died. When Judah had recovered from his grief, he went up to where the men were shearing his sheep with his friend, uh, Hira, the Adulamite, went with him. When Tamar was told, your father-in-law is on his way to Timnah to shear his sheep, she took off her widow's clothes, covered herself with a veil to disguise herself, and then sat down at the entrance of Enaim, which is on the road to Timnah. For she saw that though Sheila had now grown up, she had not been given to him as his wife. When Judah saw her, he thought she was a prostitute, for she had covered her face. Not realizing that she was his daughter-in-law, he went over to her to the roadside and said, Come now, let me sleep with you. Now, wait a minute. Let's look at this. It, it just seems to me this wasn't his first time doing this. I mean, because as we see, there's a give and take between him 
and this so-called prostitute, he knows how to make the deal. He knows what the price is. He knows what he's got. To, this wasn't his first time. Judah. Not realizing that she was his daughter-in-law, he went over to her by the roadside and said, come, let me sleep with you. And what will you give me to sleep with me? How much, how much, you, how much money you got? What you going to give me to sleep with me? Well, I, I, I'll send you a young goat for, from my flock, he said. Okay, well, you know, that, that's something you're going to do later. But, but I need some collateral now. Will you give me something as a pledge until you send it, she asked. He said, what, what pledge, what collateral should I give you? Give me your seal and its cord and the staff in your hand, she answered. Now, the seal was something like, for lack of a better term, the seal was so, sort of like the MasterCard of that day. It was a stamp that, that was, that was um, customized to the owner. The cord was something that was a, uh, two holes were drilled in the seal, and you wore that around your neck on the cord. Okay, so when you were doing business, you would take that from around your neck and stamp it on, with ink, stamp it on the document. The staff was also something that was customized to the owner. So give me your seal and, and its cord and the staff in your hand, she answered. So he gave them to her and slept with her, and she became pregnant by him. After she left and she took her off her veil and put on her widow's clothes again. Meanwhile, Judah sent the young goat by his friend, the Adulamite, in order to get his pledge back from the woman, but he did not find her. He asked the men who lived there, where is the shrine prostitute? What shrine prostitute? What's a shrine? Shrine prostitute. I told you that Judah was messing with pagans, and in the pagan religion, sex was part of their religious ritual. And so people were allowed to sleep with prostitutes, and that's what he thought. He, he thought he was sleeping with a Canaanite pagan prostitute outside of the will of his God, outside of the practice of his God. <sighs> prostitute that he seemed to know how to do business with. Uh, there hasn't, uh, and where's the prime prostitute who was uh, beside the road at Anaim. There hasn't been any shrine prostitute here, they said. So he went back to Judah and said, I didn't find her. Besides, the men who lived there said, there hasn't been any shrine prostitute here. Then Judah said, oh, oh okay, look, l let her keep what she has, or we will become laughingstocks. After all, I did send her this young goat, but you didn't find her. Let's stop for a second again. He's not concerned about God. He's not concerned about right and wrong. He's concerned about, I don't want to look foolish. I don't want to be the laughing stock. I don't want people to see, see where his mind is, Judah. I tell you, this is a band of misfits. We got Simeon and, and Levi who, who were mass murderers after their, their sister got raped. We see Reuben sleeping with his, his daddy's concubine. We see Judah already selling his brother for 20 pieces of silver, and now he's visiting prostitutes. Oh, about three months later, Judah was told, your daughter-in-law, Tamar, is guilty of prostitution, and as a result, she is now pregnant. Judah said, bring her out and have her burned to death. He, do, do you see what sin does? Sin blinds one to their own sin, but allows them to see very clearly everybody else's. That's why I'm very suspicious about people who are too dogmatic about pointing out everybody else's faults, everybody else's flaws, everybody else's failures. Sin will allow you to be blinded to your own faults, your own failure, failures, your, your own flaws, while clearly seeing everybody else's. He's just laid with this prostitute. And now he's saying because he thinks his daughter-in-law's, oh, we're going to kill her. Now, it might have been because, ooh, if I kill her, I don't have to, to give her to Sheila. But whatever the issue was, do you see the depravity of Judah here? Do you see why they're going to have to, to be in, in captivity for 400 years before they're ready to enter somebody's promised land? Then Judah said, let her keep 
Uh, no, Judah said, bring her out and have her burned to death. As she was being brought out, she sent a message to her father-in-law. I am pregnant by the man who owns these, she said. And she added, see if you recognize who seal and cord and sap these are. Judah recognized them and said, ooh, she is more righteous than I. Since I wouldn't give her to my son, Sheila, and he did not sleep with her again. When the time came for her to give birth, there were twin boys in her womb. As she was giving birth, one of them put out his hand. So the midwife took a scarlet thread and tied it around the wrist. Why? Because these were twins. These were identical twins. But the birthright had to go to the oldest one. So they had to have some way of... of signifying which one was the oldest one. So when one put out his hand, so the midwife took a scarlet thread and tied it on his wrist and said, this one came out first. But when he drew back his hand, his brother came out. And she said, oh, so this is how you have broken out. And he was named Perez. Then his brother, who had the scarlet thread on his wrist, came out, and he was named, given the name Shira. Perez or Perez would be in the line that would produce Christ. Onan is dead. Ur is dead. But now Judah has two sons of his own, Perez and Shira, who replace Onan and Ur wasn't an interruption to the story. God just wanted us to see what we're dealing with, the depravity of man. And from this, we can see sometimes God's, God's line from promise to promise land is a straight line. But don't mess it up. How long do we have to wait? How long do we have to wonder? How long do we have to grow and develop before we can inhabit God's promise. The other thing that we see that God uses jacked up, messed up people. And if he can use Judah, if he can use Simeon, if he can use Levi, if he can use Reuben to be the, the, the uh, ancestors of the 12 tribes of Israel, he can use you and me. Ooh, that's a lot. I'm telling you, that's a lot. Th this family right here, I don't know. They, they got issues, y'all. But listen, I thank you for spending this time with me as we walk through the book of Genesis. Next week, we'll pick back up Joseph and his trials, tribulations, and tests. So listen, tell a friend, tell an enemy about our walk through the book of Genesis. And maybe by the time the next chapter is over, you and your enemy will be friends. I love you. God loves you so much more. I'll see you next week. Bye-bye.